I'm going to start recording now. And to remind everyone to keep your sound off and to keep your video off, I'm just going to share my screen for a little bit as everyone piles in. Peace and love, peace and love. Welcome everyone on a Friday. Please do keep your line muted. Do not share your video. Please do not share your video. Please do not share your screen. And we employ the one strike and you're out rule here. <laughs> Early on, we'll give you a little break. That's okay. Oh, and if you have, if you, if you want to chat with us, be our guest. Please do. Please throw questions, comments, kudos, anything up in the chat box. Hello, Tandy from Indianapolis. Oh, Francisco, I'm going to turn your turn your video off. Welcome, everyone. We'll give some people some time to file in. Right. Love this shirt. Thank you. I wore this in honor of my guest today. I'm going to introduce. He's usually the one wearing tie dye. <laughs> this is the closest thing I had. <laughs> <laughs> How's everyone? Oh, Robin, good to see you. Hello from Ohio. We have our, our guest is from Ohio. Francisco from Spain, were you the one who popped up before? We'll give you a second chance, of course. Hello, to, hello in Spain. Good to see you. Thanks for coming out. A couple folks from Ohio. We got Cincinnati shouting out. Indianapolis. That's not Northern Virginia in the house. Tampa. All right. All right. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Pop out my. All right. All right. I think we can get started here. Welcome, everyone, to the uh, Friday edition. I guess it's, well, last week was Thursday. The Friday edition of the Employer Handbook Zoom Chat, HR COVID 19 Zoom Chat. I am your tie-dyed host, Eric Meyer, publisher of The Employer Handbook, theemployerhandbook.com, and also a labor and employment attorney at Fisher Broyles, that's fisherbroyles.com. The handsome gentleman with the earbuds to my left, although I don't know how it appears on your screen, and I don't know how it's going to appear on the recording later when we upload it to YouTube. He really doesn't need any introduction, but I'll, I'll, I'll give it to him anyway. It's Steve Brown. Steve, how you doing? I'm doing great, Eric. How are you, man? I'm doing real well. Why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself to like the one person here who doesn't know who you are? Oh, uh, I, I hate bios. Doggone it. All right, here we go. Uh, I'm the Vice President of Human Resources for La Rosa's Incorporated. We are a pizzeria in the Cincinnati area, greater Cincinnati area. Uh, we've been around for 65 years. Uh, I'm over every facet of HR and every person in the company, uh, primarily on the company side, and I work with franchisees. Uh, when you look at all of us, the whole chain, we have 65 stores and about 4,000 team members. Uh, so we're pretty substantial. Uh, it's a great place. Oh, and uh, the other stuff, do I have to say the other stuff? I'm on the Stern Board of Directors. Uh, I'm a blogger. I'm an author. And I'm just excited to be here, honestly. Awesome. Do you deliver to Philadelphia? I can send it to you through the internet. You have to cook it yourself. <laughs> oh, I, may do that. I may do that. I may take you up on that. <laughs> All right. So, folks, we, we got off. Oh, we got 14 people waiting in the waiting room. Come on in, guys. So, um, we've got a full agenda today. We want to hear from the audience. I got some questions submitted in advance. I mean, we have a true HR professional here. This is our first pure HR guest we've had. So 
less focus on legal. Awesome. That means I don't have to do as much work. More focus on the guest. And um, I should just in case, you know, just in case we do get into the legal, because someone's going to ask me about their obscure FFCRA question. Folks, this is a free Zoom chat. All right. I'm a lawyer, but I'm not your lawyer. Okay, my lawyer, my clients pay me money, which is nice, but I like doing this too. So just remember, anything I say does not create attorney client privilege. Anything I say is not legal advice. All right, you want legal advice? Call your lawyer and pay for it. That's what he's there for, or she's there for. Okay, um, and that goes for you clients who have snuck in here to, to attend this. I'm so surprised today. <laughs> All right. And the other thing we don't do here is we don't, we don't curse, right? We don't curse. So Steve, what was your oh shit moment? When <laughs> <laughs> uh, act that COVID-19 would have on your workplace, right? I mean, we started hearing about this, but what was the watershed moment where you're just like, oh boy. I, I think the first moment, oh shit moment was, um, how it affected my team members. And, uh, you know, we're a, a guest facing organization. We're in the people business. That's our entire business. And when your entire business model is shut down in one day, at the same time you're told you're essential. So I, I, I have team members whose families aren't working and they're working. Uh, we have people who are on the front lines. They're not, you know, getting as much recognition as some others like healthcare workers, which are doing an amazing job or first responders who are doing great jobs, uh, but we've never shut down, but our entire business model flipped. Uh, so we've pr been primarily a dine-in and a carry-out and a delivery place. So we had delivery and carry-out ready, but people don't want to come inside your store. So we, uh, the thing that we learned quickly was uh, very proud of our group. We formed a crisis response team the moment we were able to, uh, across our leadership team. Uh, but a great example is we didn't want to put our team members or guests in harm's way. So we became a curbside pickup uh, chain in one day. Wow. We, we went to, had a brainstorming session and that day we had it up and running. So it was more of a positive thing, not a reactionary thing, but in order to be viable as a business, we had to change instantly and we've uh, done well with that. And how were you able to, to balance, you know, we do this, we talk about this generally in, in, in the role of human resources, balancing the needs of the business versus balancing the needs of the workforce. And as you're literally trying to be as nimble as possible, how tough is it to balance those needs um, where you want to survive, but at sure. the same time you want your employees to, to have something to, to, to come back to or work? Sure. Uh, a couple things. Uh, what, I, what was great to see here and what I've seen across organizations is the awareness and the awakening that uh, all work is people oriented. Uh, we've never thought it was. We think it's work oriented or process oriented. And this is a people issue, flat out, no questions. So how do you balance a person who's freaking out on the front line. I've had employees lose their minds, you know, cry, scream, yell, you know, because of just the emotion and the stress. It's funny we say, uh, bring your entire self to work, except for your emotions, because that's awful. Uh, but, we, right. but, but now it's on people's, you know, it's right in front of us, it's raw. And, uh, you know, we're asking them to change on a dime constantly. I mean, the level of emails that went out, the level of uh, publications and processes and signs. I mean, it's just endless. So we had to come back and I went back to the leadership team. I was like, look, we have room to breathe. You don't think we do, but we do. Let's manage through a crisis because we've never had something this massive. And I don't think any organization has. Uh, even the, the downturn in 08, not even close. 9-11, I can remember where I was, but mm -hmm. it wasn't you didn't think of it at that point as so impactful on the business. Like you knew right away that this was just going to have this profound sustained impact on the business. And right. I, this 
is this is totally unique. Mm -hmm. So we we did, we did. It's a day by day thing. I've always believed, Eric, that HR should be practiced individually versus corporately. And because if I can take care of Eric for Eric and his needs, and then go to Gabriel for Gabriel or Danielle for Danielle, and I'm just reading your names on the Zoom call because I'm a creeper, but I have a lawyer and I can do that. Anyway, you know, when you do this and practice it individually, the whole takes care of itself. When people practice HR on the whole and think that the individuals will be taken care of, they'll get overlooked and you'll make all kinds of mistakes. We've been doing individual HR since I've been here. So we kind of rolled with it pretty easily. So you, you were talking, I'm going I'm to skip our, our, our outline a little bit because you mentioned the communication. And you're getting so many communications from the outside, but your folks, I mean, you, you, have, to, you, have, to, you have to weigh everything you're getting from the outside. It's so new. You're getting conflicting information. You're getting new information you need to digest. But at the same time, communication with your workforce, a, a, a positive, relatively consistent message has to be so important. How do you manage all that? We limited people. And what we did is say, uh, Steve can communicate, Michelle can't. And those are tough conversations because you hurt people's feelings and you didn't mean to, but we stumbled on a lot of people right away. And we were just killing people with communication like a fire hose. I mean, you could, and it would be, here comes a message from operations. Here comes a message from purchasing. Here comes a message from food. And I'm like, guys, they just want, they just need to run the operation. Let's consolidate our message. Let's make sure it's quick, timely, but let's develop mechanisms, internal mechanisms, and it's worked often. And then there's times where it fails and the, the dam gets breached. Uh, great thing, I know people are so tired of Zoom and I know we're on a Zoom call, but I had to introduce that to our organization. Because the first thing was, well, we can't communicate to everybody. I go, well, you can, and here's a method. And they went, what is this? You know, it was like talking like I was from the future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, but, but we had to bring everybody together and what happened was it just took the, the anxiety level down what people forget about communication is every time you send something out or say something people feel the need to react so you, you don't think about that you think about the message get it out get it out get it out you don't think about the person receiving it when you take time to you know craft it bring it down breathe give it consistency then you can communicate more often and more regularly instead of just blasting people with it. But we had to learn that along with everybody else. Yeah, especially tough for me as a lawyer because as a communicator, I'm not very good at listening. I like to talk and I like to get the last word. <laughs> so <laughs> we've said it's skills. Um, folks, um, for those of you who are listening patiently, um, if you have questions, please ask them in the sidebar. We have a couple of, you know, Questions already queued up. I'm going to pay attention. I'll feed them over to Steve as, I, as, I, as um, kind of it slots into the agenda here. Um, I know a bunch of you have questions about safety and communicating to employees about, you know, coming back to the workplace and is it going to be safe for them? We're, we're totally going to get to that. No worries there. Um, I do want to pivot a little bit and ask you, you know, since you handle all facets of HR, I mean, one of the facets of HR that you have to deal with is compliance. And one of the compliance areas that you had to deal with with COVID-19 are like a thousand pages of legislation that someone, either you or someone else had to distill for you between the Families First Coronavirus Response Act and CARES legislation with the PPP loans and then the Department of Labor is spouting out guidance and SBA, and EEOC, OSHA, CDC, I mean, plus state laws. You know, I mean, Ohio was really at the, at the cutting edge for, yeah. for a while there. I mean, it, um, uh, Governor DeWine was, you know, people were looking at him as, as, as kind of a, a role model. Um, as an HR professional, when all this is being just shot at you, I mean, where do you even begin? That's a great question. Uh, I don't think there's a good answer for it because uh, I think it's how you view regulations in general. Uh, in the past, I mean, the regulations have been around forever. 
we think, oh my gosh, look at all this stuff. No, this is just the new stuff. I remember when uh, the Affordable Care Act came out, people thought the world was ending because it was this massive document that wasn't well thought out in certain parts and wasn't closed in certain parts and there were open threads all over it. And people took these threads and ran. Instead of saying, we have time to digest. A, let's do the right thing, first and foremost. Secondly, when we have the chance to do the right thing and we don't know, here's where we look. I'm very active in SHRM. My staff is active in SHRM. So we reached out to them. I have a huge global network. I can put questions out to people. So I looked at it in a way of how do I connect the dots and ask other people who are going through it as well. I think HR people completely miss out in talking to their peers because there are other people who are walking these same paths. So we'd ask each other, hey, FFRCA is coming out. What are you doing? And then boom, 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 boom. And so just getting those different touch points help. Uh, and when we felt that we needed to contact our attorney, we did. We have a great relationship with our employment attorney. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that we were on the right page for anything that seemed out of sorts. The other thing then is calm down and breathe. Uh, you know, see where things tie together. There's great contradictions in all this legislation. Uh, you and I were talking about it before we came on. There's this time frame for this and this time frame for that. And this uh, reporting mechanism for this and this reporting mechanism for that. You just got to get people to calm down and take it line by line and then be responsive and consistent. Um, regulations don't freak me out because they're meant to do well for people. You just got to figure out how, how they apply, not just take it, you know, letter by letter by letter. Uh, we, we don't interpret enough. Uh, there's a lot of breadth and movement and good parameters to work within every leg legislation, including the stuff that's been coming out. Yeah, I mean, ordinarily, it talks about coming together as an HR community. And you can do that online, you can do that on the phone, you can do that by email, but this is the time of year where we do that a lot in person. Um, the SHRM Advocacy Conference was supposed to be in March, unfortunately that got canceled. Um, the SHRM Annual Conference is coming up, would have been coming up at the end of the month, uh, of June, that's gotten canceled and chapter meetings have been, uh, obviously out of an abundance of, of caution, we're not having those live. So where do you see folks coming together to get this information? And then on top of that, is that missing human element hurting us as, as an HR community, you know, in addressing COVID-19? I think uh, there's a positive and a gap. I wouldn't say a negative. The positive is this. People are reaching now, out now because they have no other choice. The majority of HR departments are departments of one or departments of two, and you can't stay on top of this. You can't. So people are like, what do I do? Fortunately, there are those who are willing to reach out. When you look at the tra chapter structure or even on the national conferences, uh, we're doing virtual things like this. The problem is, do you have an interactive environment like you and I are having, or do you have a a speaking environment where I'm just barking stuff at you and we're going through slides. Honestly, I found those very ineffective virtually, you know, I could, because I'm too distracted. I have too many things going on. Uh, I have, you know, construction going on in my house right now. That's why I'm, I'm in my office the, you know, the work environment has changed. So how we learn, how we take information has completely changed and it's going to continue to change. It's not going back to what it was. It will go back in some form. Uh, the fun thing is, I'm gonna show you, be radical here. And I know that you guys don't have your videos on, but this thing here is actually called a phone, not a computer. And I'm old, and I, what I do is I call people. And I know that's radical, but if I don't know something, I pick up a phone and call them. Because the human element that's missing lacks context. And without context, we have real issues uh, and we make a lot of assumptions. So my thing is, take the extra step. If the, if the issue is so pressing that you wanna learn and have more information, then take the time to talk to somebody. Get past the electronic mediums. And I'm not against electronic mediums. If you know me, I'm on everything, all the time. But a phone call for five minutes can take out hours of work. Um, I wish people would just communicate like this or 
dog on it, set up a Zoom meeting with two people <laughs> and just talk. Make this your medium to communicate, not just to present. Yeah, you're, you're, preach, you're preaching to the choir here. I, I, I know you didn't specifically mention the M word or, or the generation last letter of the alphabet word, but you know, like, all of us get, get, you know, maybe, maybe lose sight of the fact that we can pick up the phone and talk to people every once in a while. Sometimes it's a little more, a little more productive, a little more constructive than just exchanging emails or texts or Slack or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, what did you lean on for, for support during this? I mean, you're running, you're running this, this huge business with all of these franchises, but you, you yourself, you need support. Who do you lean on? Uh, I have an incredible community. Uh, I have for years, uh, long before it was popular or visible. Um, I have a group of 17 HR peers that I talk to every day. Uh, we, set up, we set up a group meet and we talk shop. And we talk life. We talk life a lot more than we talk shop. Uh, the big thing that I've found is missing in this is HR people forget their people. You know, we're, we're always the shepherds of others and no one takes care of us because you can't talk about 90% of what you do with anybody. So when you do, you have to have peers to talk to because it's safe. So one of the things I see missing across the board, including myself, is self-care. And uh, I, I'm a believer that if I'm not healthy, I can't be healthy for my organization. And I'm talking emotionally healthy, spiritually healthy, uh, physically healthy. Uh, it's not the COVID stuff, but all the just junk that you're in every day. So uh, I am very intentional. You and I, you know me. Uh, I'll call people on the way home every day. I have a long commute. So I'm in the car 45 minutes. If I'm driving to pizzerias, I call people. Uh, I listen to podcasts. Uh, I reach out to friends across the globe and just check in. And I do things, two things. One, I check on them because I don't want it to be about me. I know it's not that guy. Uh, but every time I check on them, they ask about me. Uh, emotional well-being is huge, and it's a giant wellness issue that's going to come up. Uh, we've been talking as my peer group that we're concerned with reopening. I know we, we are going to get to that. One of the biggest issues of reopening I'm concerned about is the emotional well-being of team members. It's going to be a giant issue. What do you think? Uh, do you think employers are really prepared to address that issue? I mean, there's no. a lot of talk. There's a lot of talk that people, you know, we're starting to focus more on mental health issues. Wasn't really on the front burner before COVID-19. COVID-19 has, has, has flashed a huge spotlight on employee mental health. Um, and employers are sort I think they're starting to at least recognize it at that's an issue, but how, how, close are they to actually addressing it properly? I think we are light years away, and this is why. It's messy, it's not predictable, and it's not the same. Uh, two people can have the same condition, if you want to get into technical, like if two people could have anxiety, but those two people won't have the same thing because they're different people. Uh, I was talking with a group of people, and I, this really bothers me, and something I've been really working on uh, we keep trying to force diversity instead of value diversity. We're diverse by nature. We're just diverse people. We have to work on inclusion. Inclusion includes mental health. It's not just the EEOC categories. So I have to accept someone for who they are. This is going to get back to that, bring your 100% of yourself. Well, I'm going to bring all my stuff too. Uh, employers, especially HR, and I'm just going to be candid to my peers and I hope my peers are on the call. Um, you got to quit focusing on crap. You know, I think there are people who are still worried about work from home policies when we've been working from home for 10 weeks. You go, oh, we don't have policy. Guess what? People are still working at home and they're doing a good job. As a profession, HR needs to change to positive intent. I'm assuming that Eric will be doing the best job because Eric's a good team member. Instead of, I have to figure out how Eric's going to mess things up and screw us because it's not happening. People are doing the right thing. So back to your first question, we're not ready because we have avoided the human side of business for decades. Humanity is messy and wonderful, both. I love that people come with a bunch of junk because I do too. <laughs> uh, 
the biggest thing that's missing in leadership is self-awareness. Um, we have to come to the realization that the majority of our day is talking about people, because it is. And uh, you know, even in your business, Eric, you don't go, hey, I have a law I want to talk about. We go, hey, here's two people that got weird. Let's talk about that. And it's a people issue. So if we would have more open, candid conversations about people that were safe, I think we'd have more conversations and people would be, uh, I don't think employees feel safe to talk about it yet. Um, I don't think it's a stigma issue as much as people throw that out. I think it's more of a, we're just not comfortable having uncomfortable conversations. How much control does HR have over this issue? And, and this is gonna be a, a, a a poor comparison, but it's the, it's the first thing that popped into my head just because of the recency effect. You know, me too. And, 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 and what we heard from the EEOC after me too is that the way that you affect change in the workplace is this top-down approach with a culture, you know, this great culture that starts from the very top of the organization, accountability, there's got to be pain at all levels, blah, blah, blah. So here we are in a totally different situation. Um, but if, if, if leadership isn't, you know, isn't aligned with HR, how much, how much can HR possibly move the needle? Oh, you're dead right. If, if leadership, well, first of all, HR should be leaders, period, not roles, leaders, because I can lead from wherever I'm at. Uh, technically I'm a VP, you know, we will never have a CHRO in our organization because we're too small. Am I the CHRO? Yes. Does that make me a leader? No, it's a freaking title. <laughs> Leadership is I'm accountable to the organization. So I have a great relationship with the CEO on purpose because I want him to succeed, not because he's the CEO. So I'm there to shepherd every employee. So that includes everybody that's got a C in front of their name down to the person on the front line. Uh, HR has to align itself with the entire organization and too many HR people don't. We rely on systems, we rely on policies and procedures and layers instead of saying, I'm gonna get up, I'm gonna go talk to my people. Uh, while we've been on the call here, I've had two of my general managers call me and they've called me because they have something they need to talk about. And chances are it's an issue, but they know that they have access to me and I have access to them. It's a two way street. So when you had come up with serious issues like Me Too or uh, inclusion issues or disability issues, or all the stuff that we work with, the, the more grayer areas of our job, um, they have to know that HR is consistent, accessible, and approachable. And if you can do those three things, you can align things better. And you can also address it when people get out of line. So if you have a leader who just says, I'm not gonna do this, because uh, going back to your example of me too, they're saying, well, what did HR not do? If you're not tied to the people of your organization, everything in the world can happen and you'll never know it. And then you're surprised and your place is on fire. I like to turn it around. Uh, when I hear HR, HR people say, I'm a fire, I, um, I fight fires. Get out of HR. You should be a firefighter. I'm an HR person who starts fires. I know so much going on in the organization. I have the pulse of everywhere. So I know when things are happening ahead of time because I'm connected to my people, including leadership. So it doesn't matter what your title is or your role is, you have to be tied into them. One of the overarching themes of what we've been talking about so far is beyond communication is, is safety um, and, and keeping the workplace safe and communicating to employees that they have a place to come back to out of their homes where maybe they feel most safe, but a place where hopefully they can feel almost just as safe in the workplace. What are some balanced approaches to account for the needs of business while keeping employees safe? I think there's a lot more latitude to move than you think. Again, if you lead with the regulation, for instance, uh, the, the one that drives people crazy, face coverings, masks. People are like, it says this, ah, black and white. No, it says, Here's what's recommended and. and so, and then inside of that, I, you know, we have team members who say, I can't wear a mask because, and they have medical documentation. So I'm keeping the regulation side good and taking care of my team member at the same time. But then I'm communicating to the other team members who have to wear face coverings 
this is okay. We're going to be fine. It's really being very clear and not beat around the bush, uh, Eric. A lot of people uh, in HR, and I'm going to sound harsh, and I don't mean this in a bad way, we dance around things. Hey, it's going to be fine. Ah, I believe in being direct with grace. <laughs> hey, I need you to do this because. And when someone stumbles, because they will, you coach them up and you say, hey, let's do this differently now. Uh, it works. But to you can't make uh, it lip service. Safety is such a critical issue. And what's funny is safety was always a critical issue. It, it's not now. Uh, right. I mean, I work, I work in the food business. You get bad food, it's a bad thing. Yeah. It goes everywhere. So yes. for safety is huge for us. So this is just a different layer. I think it's how you frame things. If people would say, this is how we're evolving and changing, you'll be much happier than saying, this is new. It's the new this. It's the new that. No, it's the next. It's, Great it's, point. The, it's the newest. You know, we can't, we're trying to land somewhere. HR and business never land. I wish people would understand this. It's a continuum. It never change, stops. It just keeps going. And sometimes there's giant changes like the, the oh shit moment from COVID <laughs> to the, oh, hey, uh, I'll give you a great example. Uh, my HR manager came in today and her babysitter flaked out. And I should, I came in today, but I have to leave. And now we go, oh no, no one's in the office. Do I say, hey, I'm sorry, you're gonna have to figure something else out because I'm sorry that your babysitter didn't show up. I go, no, we got it, let's go. You got to ebb and flow. Uh, I, I think people in all departments, HR in every department would, would um, do a lot better if they'd be a little more pliable all the time. <laughs> Speaking of pliable, how about the employees who, maybe not in your workplace, but in workplaces generally, who have been collecting unemployment, yeah. maybe collecting more on unemployment than they were getting paid in the workplace, Mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden, workplaces are opening and they're being asked to come back. I mean, how do you convince someone to come back to work? Uh, it, that's the million dollar question. <laughs> <laughs> we, do, we do have that. Uh, I think there's a couple of things. Uh, I can't fight dollars arguments. If you're making more and that's more important to you, that's your choice. However, understand there are consequences. And you say, hey, if you do this, Here's my obligation. Well, you can't do that. Why? Yeah, I have to. Here's my obligation. So I, I don't throw it at somebody, but heck, I know some people who may just not return at all. It's not just return because of unemployment. Now, we're really concerned. And when you see the regulations coming out because the country is hurting, I, we, we have to remember that. Right now, I'm focusing on my people and my company, but the country is hurting. The government's trying to write these broad brush things to take care of every employer in every industry. How do you do that? That is so difficult. And in the, under that, every person in every industry and in every company says, but at my place, it's this. We're just having candid conversations. And I would say the best thing to say to employers is, if you have the kind of culture and value your people and allow them to perform, that's more attractive than money. Short term, I can't beat if you're getting this extra $600 a week. Can't. But if you say, I want to go back because that's where I love to be, and those are the people I love to work for, and that's the work I love to do, you have a better chance of being successful. But it's not an all or nothing type of proposition. By the way, right now, uh, I don't know if you're looking at the Zoom chat uh, feature, Steve, but you got some folks who are looking to submit their resumes to, uh, to La Rosa's. <laughs> <laughs> you. So, I, uh, I, you know, I turned off the file sharing function. I'm sorry, but, um, you know, maybe you have to, you know, he'll holler at you. Um, I, do want to say, I do want to say one thing before we lose it. Paige asked, um, consistent, approachable, and the other one is accessible. There's two different sides to it. Uh, how do I approach others and how do they approach me? That's key to leadership. The second thing is, am I accessible? Uh, it's great. And I'm sure you see this, Eric, with your clients. Hey, do you have an open door policy? Isn't that funny? I fire people for policies, uh, for do's and don'ts, but I have to have a door open policy? I don't get it. Because most open door policies are don't interrupt me policies. We have to understand that organizations interrupt each other all the time. I love when um, you mentioned you have four kids running around. My kids are adults. 
I don't even know if they're alive. Uh, that's not true. They're, they're doing great. Uh, it's hard to do humor on a Zoom call. It really is. Uh, my youngest one's probably playing out in the street right now. It's, yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's okay. what's, funny, what's funny is we think that everything has to be uh, just sterile. Hey, you and I are having a conversation, Eric, so don't interrupt. That's not life. Um, I think organizations, HR especially, and leadership needs to understand that we need to work within interruptions because interruptions is how we work. It's how life is. Uh, we keep trying to have these compartmentalized episodes outside of our normalcy. That's just stupid. I'm sorry. It's narrow thinking. Interruptions are normal. So how do you work within them? If you start doing that from an HR perspective, your employees will understand, hey, you're like me. And they'll, they'll jump right in. And, and just, I'll give a, a bit of a friendly tip, a, a bit of like non-legal lawyerly advice. When you're having those candid discussions, phone. <laughs> <laughs> not Slack, not tech. Yeah. Because that becomes exhibit A. <laughs> I agree. In person, even better. I agree. <laughs> um, remote work is something we've seen, of course, a lot of. Um, Zoom, you know, I was, on a, I was on a webinar yesterday where I'll shamelessly steal someone's you know, Zoom was something we did with cameras a couple of years ago. Zoom in on someone, you know, we did Zoom. <laughs> um, is re I mean, we've had remote work for a while, but I mean, it's really picked up. Mm -hmm. How close are we going to get back to where we started or how close are we going to stay to where we are now? Remote I think you're going to have a hybrid. One of the biggest things, since we, since we threw the generational term out there, uh, one of the things that's hilarious is we think that if people are visible, they're working. They're not. They're visible. So if I see you in the office, then I have control. That's the biggest freaking myth. And it's, and it's funny because if that was true, we'd never have an employer issue or employee issue because everybody's diligent because they're sitting at their desk. And again, back to positive intent. Um, I think you need to have a hybrid. We need to be a fluid workplace. You're never going to have 100% full offices again ever. Um, the next COVID something will happen. Right now, we had to pivot in a way we never had to as a society. And now people are saying, it's, it's funny, it was easy to shut down, but it's impossible to open up. Have you noticed that? Yeah. You know, sh shutting down is, hey, go to home, go home. Okay, now come back to work. Well, I can't come to back to work. I'm freaking out. What's going on? Well, you got to because it's the rule. Nope. And you've got to have a policy, shameless plug for me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, uh, I think we're going to have a very flexible workplace, uh, which I think is healthy, honestly. Uh, hopefully, this will be more forward-facing to people. The virtual side, if it's 100% virtual all the time, there are some uh, research coming out right now that it's very unhealthy that you're 100% virtual because you miss human contact. I'll tell that to my bosses. <laughs> <laughs> I see your conferences. Yeah, I'm healthy as heck. I'm wearing an MTV type ID t shirt on it. What, what could be more healthy? Um, That's balance. Yeah, someone asked, is this being recorded? It is, but I'm going to charge for the re no, no, free replay. Well, I'm going to put it up on the uh, Employer Handbook YouTube channel when it's done. Definitely, will, and, I'll, and I'll put out, we'll tweet out links. It'll be in the blog. We'll make sure people who did not see this uh, we'll get a chance to really uh, get, uh, not screw an hour of me, but an hour of Steve. It's, it's uh, definitely way more than the, the price of admission. Um, one of the tough things about return to work, and we're talking about recognizing efficiencies and new ways to work, is that maybe you don't bring everyone back because right. you've, you've built a better mousetrap. Um, that's difficult too. Um, yes. How do you manage that? Telling people you are furloughed and we want to, you know, we had every intention of bringing you back, but now we're not. It's a tough, that's tough. And that's huge. Uh, I don't know that there is a good way. Um, I had some good advice from Karitha Rushing, who was the board chair uh, before David Winley, and I admire Karitha. She was the former CHRO of Equifax. And she said this, as employers, I, we should treat people red carpet in and red carpet out. So 
now your circumstances change. You've realized efficiencies. You, you used to have a workforce of 30. Now you want to go down to 20 because you can run better with 20. Well, then duck on it. You know, give people the red carpet. Uh, be consistent. Look at severance packages. Be willing to make that spend that you say you can't. If you're going to make the choice to be smaller, then, then put the budget aside and have mechanisms to take care of people to allow them to transition with grace. Uh, to just cut people off because now you're realizing this uh, different efficiency says a lot about you and your culture. It, you should value your people before they become your employees and as candidates till the time they choose to go somewhere else or they are going somewhere else. Uh, this is a case by case basis. I am on the other side. I mentioned earlier, we have some people who aren't going to come back to work that we valued, that we really liked. Well, now what do we do? Do we instantly hire or do we have a hiring strategy? Do we have a workforce planning strategy? Uh, this is a great time for HR to be strategic broadly, not this whole seat at the table crap that was never true. It's, uh, hey, how are we strategically looking at our function to help the organization succeed? It's where we always should have been positioned. So that way, when you have that, Eric, when you have to make those tough decisions of, hey, we're not bringing you back, you're, you're better prepared because you have a strategic approach to what you're doing. At the same time, you're going to have pretty hard conversations full of emotion. It may not go well. Injecting some legal into it. Um, you know, at my role, I, I come in when there's a severance agreement, I draft it. And then if someone doesn't sign and they decide they want to sue for whatever reason, you know, I'm there. Given what you just talked about, Steve, about putting your, your best foot forward, putting the company's best foot forward, red carpet in, red carpet out, do you lose sleep over the possible, you know, EEOC charge of discrimination or fallout that comes from someone who doesn't make it back to the workplace involuntarily? No. Uh, this is why. Uh, I've always had to understood that people can sue anybody for any reason at any time. I think we should be diligent and not reckless, but to operate in fear, no. And my big thing, and I've said it and I see it in the chat, consistency is what I work from, not fairness. I'm consistent here, 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 so that we have the best possibility to treat you well the entire time here. We fail at times. I don't want to sound utopian, but we have the practice of doing this consistently with our people. If somebody feels that they need, they were wronged or they have, the, they have the right to take any action they choose, then it becomes, okay, were we prepared? Did we document? How do we treat people? Uh, and you hope that you've trained your people enough that they're consistent with their people. It's hard because you can't predict or control. You never could. Uh, do I lose sleep over it? No. My thing is I want to do our best every time and that's a high standard but when we do that um, i'll give you a great example uh, we've had our unemployment claims go up just like everybody but comparatively it is minor compared to the cost of our employees and i know there are people who uh, are not working who didn't file and they're coming back that doesn't happen in an organization unless they're treated well on a consistent basis or they know that they have an avenue to talk when something does go wrong. Um, I, I, I hope you understand, I'm not trying to talk in all these very high lofty terms and I don't practice it. This is what we do um, to our best of our ability. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. And at the end of the day, you have EPLI insurance too, just in case. You know? We do. Oh, we have, all the, we have all the mechanisms. Trust me, I don't, I don't do anything on my own. I have a big right. safety net. Uh, but I also have partners, uh, if I can just speak candidly, for those of you as employers, if you don't have a partnership with your employment law uh, attorney, um, you're messing up because there are great people that do work in all kinds of firms, but they should be a partner with you and for you and protect you, hear you out, give you options, um, understand your organization and your culture. And then, I mean, I call mine on a regular basis just to say, Hey, we're thinking about this. Where do you think we should go before issues happen? Yeah. And, th and then when issues happen, we're ready. But we don't, uh, a lot of HR people call because there's a fire. It's too late. Yeah, there, there's a, there, we've heard that penny wise, pound foolish adage. And, and it, it's, 
it's never truer than it is now because there are so many unknowns. Um, and, it's, and it's usually a short conversation that I'm having with a client or a really short email, a, a discreet issue. And maybe I'll issue spot something new, but we get it resolved and we move on. Um, if it's someone who you have a question about with Families First Coronavirus Response Act, we can usually get it done like right away. Um, I mean, maybe it's a little bit more involved because someone has a spouse and this and that, but we get it done and it, it avoids the lawsuits that, look, I'm starting to see. Um, and I'm, we're going to see in the yeah. second half of 2020 and, and especially probably fourth quarter in 2021, we're going to see the discrimination lawsuits. Um, I read the other day that the New York District Office of the um, New York City District Office of the EEOC is already starting to get the COVID-19 related discrimination charges. Sure. Every one of them has checked the disability box. So we talked earlier about mental health. I mean, that's got to be a big focus for folks um, in HR from a compliance standpoint, and not just mental health. I mean, someone says that they're immunocompromised. You got to take that really seriously and be thinking about an interactive dialogue with them under the Americans with Disabilities Act. What can you do to accommodate um, the Family and Medical Leave Act? You may need to provide leave. Good old fashioned, we forgot about it, FMLA. It's not yeah. At least first coronavirus response act, but there may be that there too. So um, these are some issues that 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 um, from a compliance side we need to be focused on. And I agree with you, Steve. If we put our best foot forward, and and we balance the human side with, you know, we do what's right, but we also do what's what's compliant. And someone's going to sue. You know, we'll, we'll deal with it. That's right. that's what I'm here for. I mean, we'll we'll deal with it. The other thing we do with that, Eric, is this. Um, my Everything is decentralized. I have a small staff. I have three other people, two great people that work with me. And then we have to support all of our organizations. We've established such a relationship that when an issue comes up, a person goes to their manager. That manager calls us. And, and they don't call us like, oh my gosh, it's on fire. They say, hey, I had this happen. Uh, and I don't know what to do. What can I do? And we talk through things. So we do coaching constantly and listen. And uh, one of the things I've been trying to teach people is listen to understand, not listen to solve. And you can solve if it's needed, but sometimes people just want to be heard. And if they're heard, genuinely heard, not just, you know, giving them lip service. If people are genuinely heard, you're going to just lower the level of people's anxiety, lower the levels of people's uh, distrust. Uh, there's all kinds of things that can work that will hopefully lessen the liability. Yeah, it comes back full circle back to communication. I mean, that's where we started this conversation today and just being available and accessible and talking to people. I agree with you, really, it, 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 it dials things down a lot. Um, we have a few questions that have been submitted. And folks, if you have more questions, you got about 10 minutes left. I want to be, uh, um, I want to respect your time. I want to respect Steve's time. If you've got questions, please ask them. Uh, I do want to, can I jump in on one? Yeah, sure. Uh, I saw the uh, chat from the people with nonprofits. Understand, I have a variable workforce that is 85% part-time. So we don't have a bunch of packages and such. Here's what I mean. If someone leaves, uh, I have conversations with them nine times out of 10 and say, hey, you know, Eric, this isn't for you. That's cool. May I help you? Can I help you network? Can I get you connected to someone else? Can I be a neutral reference? There's all kinds of things you can step in to be that connection for that person so they transition out well. I understand you can't give money to everybody. If there's a severance package issue, you absolutely need to talk to your attorney so you do it right and it's consistent. Uh, and it covers every base, but you have got all, you're not a prison, you're an employer. And we have people for a certain life cycle. So take care of them while they're here, but be that gracious host that helps them on the way out. I'm a reference for people. I'll call p other employers and go, hey, how can I help you? This great person's leaving our organization or we had a furlough, we couldn't bring people back. Step in the gap and be that person for somebody else 
and bridge that connection for them, you'd be amazed what happens. They'll talk about you for years and years and years to come, and they'll also do that for others going forward. Ready for a few questions? Sure. These range from uh, broad to a uh, question being asked for a friend, hypothetically. <laughs> But I'll handle some of those. But I want to okay. ask. I want. I want to get to as many questions as we can that 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 call upon Steve to respond, as opposed to me. You, you see me every week. We get Steve only once. So, I, w I do want to ask this one question um, that I think some employers might be dealing with as we return to work is, what happens, Steve? In your experience, someone's been traveling, um, and they want to return to work. Um, we get, you know, we're getting all sorts of conflicting guidance. Or I want to say conflicting guidance, but evolving guidance about what to do with employees that have traveled that want to come back to the workplace. Generally speaking, how, how have you guys been handling? Uh, we've done two things. One, we use the 14 day window as our first, but we have conversations. So we're aware of our team members who've uh, traveled for PTO or if they traveled for a family situation or if while they've been off work, they travel. So those are the components that we know. We're monitoring it and we've been using 14 on the biggest side 14 days. Mm -hmm. And then we've gone down to 72 hours. Um, and we've said, hey, and, but we have a self-checking mechanism in our organization where people are self-checking and documenting that they're self-checking. So it's not just, hey, hey, you're self-checking. We have a form that they need to fill out. They have to and we have to assume they're being honest. Right. <laughs> Again, positive intent. I'm sure there's somebody who could not. Uh, but what we've forgotten is people have illnesses all over the place, not just COVID. Uh, so some of the things that we've just lost sight of, of you know, if you're sick, don't come to work. Does that mean if I don't have COVID? No, if you're sick, don't come to work. <laughs> you know, we gotta open people back up because we've become, we've become so narrowly focused on COVID only that we've forgotten the rest of life around it. Um, but then uh, we're very quick to react. If anybody, uh, I had a great example. I had somebody who goes, I have a headache. Should I send them home? I said, okay, let's read the list again. There are eight symptoms. They have a headache. I think you're good. They go, okay, thanks. And they breathe. But uh, allow people to have those conversations. Don't, be, don't tell them they're stupid. Don't tell them it's senseless. Take the time and answer the questions. Yeah, if you're anything like some of my friends, they've been keeping Miller and Cor Miller Coors in business during this. Uh, COVID <laughs> you're gonna have a headache, in the morning, you know. <laughs> it's it's um, it's all good. Oh, here's a great question. Uh, shout out to John Hyman on the Ohio Employer Law Blog who blogged about this earlier this week. So, out at Lake of the Ozark, you see this? Big yes. Party. So, what happens, Steve, if you? You're looking at this video because it's newsworthy and you see a couple of your employees out there partying, no masks, they're in the pool, they're getting, you know, getting, we people say, still say getting jiggy, and then they're getting you know, <laughs> time with, with, with other co people there. What do you do about getting them back into the workplace? I, I think you go back to this uh, self check. Yeah. And, and it, people make bad decisions all the time. Again, if this is not, we're like, oh my gosh, we overreact. Um, I'll just be candid. I don't breathe well, never have. I have allergies that kill somebody. So face coverings are a challenge for me. I do my best with them. But if I don't wear a face mask, people become vigilantes. We're employers. You need to say, I understand you were here and you traveled and you did this. Here's our process. If you go outside the process, we're going to address it. And you already know all the rules up front. Uh, so I may not agree with what they did or I may, I may not like, but to comment on it, that's not, I'm not, I'm the employer. I, you know, I want you to, people make choices I don't make all the time. <laughs> so I, I would take it case by case and go, wow, that was a decision. Well, well done. And then I will ask them, did you get jiggy? And they'll go, you old man. <laughs> um other question you mentioned earlier steve uh a few minutes ago about employees self-certifying that they're mm -hmm. basically feeling okay um and, and that's something that that i've been doing a lot with clients as well is the self-certification rather than having people show up and 
someone from HR don the PPE and point the, uh, the, the meat thermometer thing at someone's forehead? I mean, what are your thoughts on taking temperatures in the workplace? I think it's a challenge. And what we've forgotten is this. We're focusing on the temperature. What happens when you have a, a reading? What, I mean, you're asking a team member that's not their job, okay? No one has, no one's a temperature checker. I don't know anybody who has, that's their job or a role or they're paid just to do that. So you're taking somebody whose normal job is something else and putting them potentially in harm's way to take temperatures of others. Now, unless, unless you have they the have six foot arms so they can do yes. it, social distance. Uh, and we've looked at equipment. We've looked at the thermal scanning equipment, you know, and uh, we, that's a lot of money. I mean, mm -hmm. it just is. So you have to look at the safety of both people. One is the person trained on what to do. Is it in a place where it's not breaking privacy laws? Because what if you find information? Uh, three, people have <laughs> fevers. <California>. And, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Pe right. People have fevers and don't have COVID. Surprise. Uh, uh, one of my friends who works in healthcare said he gets checked every day when he goes in. Uh, and he wants to see how low he can get his temperature just to freak people out. And he's a great employee. So he had a temperature of 89. They're like, you're dead. We don't think, we think everything is the worst. Somebody who has a 99.9 .9 degree fever is sick to some extent. But all we're worried about is the 100.4. You're putting a lot of pressure on people. Um, so the self-check is what we're going with. Um, I'm afraid people won't be consistent with it. Or when they get the information, they'll freak out and talk about it with people. Uh, it just scares me to death. Uh, that scares me a lot more than anything else. Like, when they run around, they go, did you know that Eric had 102 degree fever? Yeah. I'll bet you he's got COVID. It's going to die and kill everybody. You go, oh, no. It just opens the door for way too much speculation. Yeah, and let's close with that last question. Um, someone... Uh, Martin here asked a question, everyone. There was big news in Pennsylvania where, where I practice about a, um, a congressperson, state rep, um, uh, who had a positive COVID-19, but they didn't tell the other members of the Senate and House for like a week. Now, quarantine, it wasn't like he was going to work, but that, that, that information wasn't distilled. Um, and getting to what you were talking about, Steve, you know, there's this balance of, of privacy. Um, how do you handle that tension between protecting people's confidential health information and giving employees information to ensure a safe workplace? It's a tightrope. I'll be honest. It's a tightrope because uh, I find most people don't handle confidential information well, including HR people. Uh, and I don't mean that in a harsh way. It's just we get confidential information constantly, including things like health information. So I have a very tight circle of people that find out information. And if I find that you breach it, we address it instantly. But we try and take it out of people's hands so that it goes through HR. Very few controls go through HR. But when it comes to privacy and confidential information, we, we own that. So um, uh, quick example. Uh, we've had people who uh, thought that they had the virus and uh, they were told they had that and it turned out to be false positive and they were told by a health organization. So the minute it happens, we set up the communication standard that if you hear the words COVID or symptoms, you call HR. I mean, it's not a question and everybody does because honestly, they want to get it out of their hands. So my team is like, hey, if we hear it, Here's our, here's our practice, boom. And so I'll talk to the team member and say, I'm the person you talk to. You talk to no one else. You try and set those standards up uh, so that you do your best not to have that information leak because in this case, it was wrong. And the person was mortified. We did all the things that the Board of Health told us to do. In fact, we called the Board of Health and said, hey, we have the situation and they took care of us through it. They were wonderful partners. Uh, I find that from the regulatory side of things, if you're proactive and say, we're trying to do the right thing, this is what we want to do, and this is what they want to know, they will jump because most employers are not. They're fearful. Uh, I, I think it's a mistake. Um, so my thing is be upfront, intentional, consistent, and uh, proactive. I can't tell you the number of times that I've recommended to clients 
call your local health board, call your state health board. I mean, heck, clients call me, I'll call the, the board to get some answers. And they're great. I agree with you wholeheartedly, Steve. It's a great resource for right. employers. Um, we've come to the top of the hour, folks. Uh, I want to thank Steve. I want to thank everyone who attended here. Did you like this? Let us know in the, in, in the chat. Let us know. Do you want more HR professionals being our special guests or should we go back to the lawyers? <laughs> you both? I don't know. I, I've, although I've got a little surprise in store for, for folks in the coming weeks. Um, but uh, yeah, let us know. Um, also, I want to give chance, uh, Steve a chance to uh, anything he wants to on the way out. Uh, do you have a new book? Yeah, you want to plug LaRosa's again? Oh, sure. What do you got? I, uh, real quick. Um, first of all, thank you for taking the time to be here. I really appreciate it. I don't take it for granted. And for you to sit and listen to some guy you may or may not know is amazing to me. Secondly, if you are not connected on LinkedIn, why aren't we? You should connect with me right now. Because, uh, and I sound, I, I don't, I'm not a good person talking about myself, but I'm one of the most connected HR people you'll ever meet on the planet. And if I can be a resource for you, please reach out, connect with me. Twitter, huge on Twitter, uh, at S Brown HR, E on the end of Brown. Uh, and the only plug I'll do is this. i um, been very fortunate. I wrote a book called HR on Purpose, uh, which talks about HR more like we talk today. And my new one, HR Rising, is coming out in a couple of weeks. Uh, and it's talking about how to be a leader in HR. So uh, it'll be on Amazon. I hope you check it out. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Steve. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Remember to hit the record button, so we're going to throw this up on, on, on YouTube pretty soon. Everyone, stay safe, stay well, and have a great weekend. See ya. Take care. Thanks for coming.